Are you ready to continue the conversation on an issue that's imperative for the rebirth of business? Well, we are. Welcome into Beating Backlash Against BIPOC Women Professionals. That's women professionals who are, whether they're binary, trans, or non-binary, but they're also Black, Indigenous, or people of color. My name is Adrian Lawrence, and I'm going to be leading our conversation for today. And to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I'm the host of Appealing with Adrian Lawrence, a new nightly cable news show on the Black News Channel. I'm also a reformed attorney, uh, also a very devoted gender equity advocate. I've been honored to be among the 2020 Take the Leads Top 50 Women Who Can Change Journalism. And I'm also the author of Staying in the Game, the playbook for beating workplace sexual harassment. And today I am joined by three very talented voices who I'd like to introduce you to now. A tech guru through and through, Tammy Cho is the CEO and founder of Better Brave. It's a nonprofit that empowers everyday people with knowledge and tools for navigating workplace discrimination. Tammy has created online community platforms from coast to coast, being named Georgetown Entrepreneur of the Year and a power woman in DC tech. She not only uplifts BIPOC women in the workplace, however, she also fights against racism as Tammy recently founded the Hate is a Virus campaign to combat anti-Asian American sentiment emerging from COVID-19. So I know today's topic can be a little heavy, but let's go ahead and lighten the load with a fun question for you, Tammy. What's your most irrational fear? Hmm, that's a great question. I would say my most irrational fear is probably I don't go on cruises because I have a fear that they will catch on fire and the sink, the ship will sink. <laughs> that, that, that is definitely an irrational fear. Thank you for sharing that with us and thank you for joining us today. And next up, we have Dr. Metha Alhassan, who is a race historian, feminist educator, and ground level organizer. Her work bridges the worlds of digital media engagement, academic research, and organizing social change. Now, with a wealth of experience and a PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from USC, Dr. Alhassan is an authority on race and gender power structures and on speaking truth to power. And she shared her insight on TED Talk stages, and also she's appeared across many major networks. Dr. Alhassan leads projects that unlock new pathways for women of color in society. So Maytha Alhassan, doctor, please, who would play you in a movie about your life? <laughs> That's so funny because I am actually trying to write a pitch for an episodic show and been tackling my mind thinking about who would be that person. I'm going to go with somebody who is not an actor, but a public figure, and that would be ML Clooney. Very nice. I can appreciate that. Excellent. And thank you so much for joining us. And last but not least, we have a Cornell Certified Diversity Professional Advanced Practitioner. That's Robert Bevan. He comes to us from the C-suite of Jennifer Brown Consulting, where he's the Chief Operating Officer. Now, Robert drives change by using technology to help companies tailor anti-discrimination efforts that uplift BIPOC women in the professional world to ensure that they feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard. Now leading a diverse team at JBC, Robert collaborates with everyone from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses. You know, because at the end of the day, creating lasting change in corporate America is Robert's goal. So Robert, my first question to you, if you were an X-Men, what superpower would you choose for yourself? Wow, um, I think it would be the ability to um, give sight. And by that, I mean to give the ability for people to see through other people's eyes, because we, you know, we, we like to try to understand or try to have an awareness, but I think it would be amazing for us to actually have a lived experience um, as, as someone that's not like ourselves. Oh, that's such an ethical right answer, whereas <laughs> I would just teleport so I could like steal stuff, but whatever. Um, <laughs> no, thank you so much. For joining us. Uh, now that you've all kind of gotten to know a bit of our panelists, um, wait, I think actually Tammy wants to ask me a question. Yeah, I do. I do. Adrian, now that you know some of our deepest secrets, <laughs> our turn to ask you a question. What would be your greatest strength in a zombie apocalypse? Um, I like that one because it's something I think about often. You can just ask my therapist. It is quite uh, morbid indeed, but in a zombie apocalypse, I would I'd be, my, my strength would be uh, decisiveness. I can make decisions very quickly and uh, really just move forward because you can't always be democratic or even diplomatic when you are running from you know, dead beings. 
So thank you so much for that question as we got to peek into my mind, which operates in a very funky way. But let's go ahead and jump into talking about beating backlash against BIPOC women professionals. So with the pushes for racial equality resounding and also the pandemic playing out in the background, you know, the volatility of this environment it's really exacerbated the discrimination against some of the most vulnerable professionals, which are BIPOC women. And even before the pandemic and the racial reckoning that we see going on in society, BIPOC women filed 56% of all gender discrimination complaints with the EEOC. That's the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And this is despite comprising just 37% of the workforce. So that's a huge disparity there. And it's a loss for companies in terms of turnover and potential legal fees and settlements and so much more. So let's kind of start from the bottom and look at why and how we have these problems. Now, Dr. Al Hassan, I know you've studied this extensively and you have more of an understanding on the sociological reasons behind this. So I would love to ask you generally, why do these harass holes harass and well-meaning professionals unleash bias against BIPOC women professionals so much more? Thank you for that. I think it's a really important point to frame our conversation. One thing that we have to understand is the reason movements are calling for disruption of systems is when they're not disrupted, they're very easily reproduced unconsciously. So what we understand as a extreme amount, an exponential amount of harassment directed towards BIPOC women is part of the course of the system that we live in in America that intersects racism, um, sexism, and how we should actually think about this is a definition I love from Ruthie Wilson Gilmore for racism. And I'm paraphrasing it right now because she has like this very thick, dense sentence, which I encourage everybody to go look up. But basically what she says is racism is a disproportionate exposure to premature death that makes people vulnerable as well. So if we understand that that's already happening outside of the workplace, it makes sense that it would enter the workplace as well. And so when we are trying to start these movements, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, this is part of a raising of consciousness of conditions, of material conditions that already exist and are produced and reproduced through these systems. So what we are asking is how can we shift those material conditions, but more so what we're targeting are systems so that they don't continue to be perpetuated. And so when we have a systemic analysis, it does affect the workplace, interpersonal interactions. It does affect internalized racism and gender inequity or discrimination. So that's how we have to start looking at it. Apologies if it's more systematic, systematic than, than trying to give you a little bit of data, but that's how I start to approach why as a woman of color who enters the academia or media or Hollywood, I continue to face the same exact struggles over and over again. Those systems, those industries understand each other because they are absorbing and reproducing those systems. Thank you so much for enlightening us on that issue. And I know Robert, you're a part of the systems and also you work with systems to dismantle and to change them. So, you know, from what you've seen and you've experienced, why do you think that BIPOC women are targeted the most? That's a great question. I mean, I think that it's, you know, from coming out of the Me Too movement, you know, we saw a lot of BIPOC women saying, standing with, with non-BIPOC women saying, well, it's great to have you on board finally, after we've been doing this for, centuries. And I think that one of the challenges that it's still seen, you know, you have different disproportionates across the board of whiteness, right, and white privilege. And typically, we've seen that only around men, and we've really not talked about it from a female perspective. And so we do have white privilege in different aspects. And while men have the most, um, white women also carry some of that privilege. And when I was at a conference about six years ago, uh, a women's conference was interesting because we started to have this conversation and it became apparent that there's a lot of women that were unaware that they too had white privilege because they thought they were part of the you know women overall and was the movement you know going for the me too movement etc so it's still a struggle where racism still exists within our country and obviously the covid is a horrific you know 
thing that's happening now, racism is probably our oldest disease within the within the country. Yes, um, that is very much the truth. And also, you know, as we know that it's not just men uh, essentially praying or harassing BIPOC women, but also women who enjoy the white privilege or whatever their circumstances are, and that's problematic. And so, Tammy, I'd love to hear from you on this issue because, you know, we have BIPOC women facing gender and racial discrimination, and it's that intersectionality, that uniqueness of getting both of those things in that attack. You know, from your work as a founder of Better Brave, what are some of the unique forms of workplace discrimination that you've seen women face? That's a great question. So, you know, through my work with Better Brave and Hate is a Virus as well, I've gotten to have a unique lens and ear into the different ways this manifests in our world today, especially during the pandemic. And, you know, I'll start off with the racial factors, right? So there are quite a few statistics that demonstrate how people have been targeted by their race. You know, one example is on top of how indigenous people have already have poor access to health care, they're more likely to have the highest rates of mistreatment in hospitals um, during this pandemic. There's another study, a Pew Research study, that also found that nearly 58% of Asian Americans and 45% of Black Americans surveyed said that it was more common for them to, uh, for people to express racist views toward their group. Uh, since the coronavirus outbreak. And so considering those factors, then adding the additional dimension that, you know, BIPOC women are dealing with attacks that are also related to their gender as well. And one more example that I'll share here is um, the JAMA Internal Medicine Group published a recent report which found that female physicians, for instance, are not only attacked for their views um, on different issues like vaccines, but have also found that nearly one in six female physicians experience different forms of online sexual harassment as well. And so it's been, it's something that's really important for us to consider as we think about how do we break down these systems? Why are these issues continuing to occur and discuss, have dialogue on different solutions for it? Yes, uh, having these dialogues is so incredibly important and also educating ourselves and the individuals around us so we can understand why and how these forms of discrimination are manifested. Uh, for example, in my book, I break down uh, pretty much for each racial group or uh, also ethnic group for the kind of discrimination that they may face when it is uh, sexualized. For example, with black women being treated as you know the Jezebels or these legacies that follow us from slavery, also the angry black woman, and how these subtle slights can appear in professional spaces. And that's such a, it's a demeaning thing, and it can interfere with one's ability to do their job, and especially when the company doesn't necessarily have that tone and tenor to support them. And Robert, you know, I know you work with a lot of companies that tend to struggle with eliminating bias, or at least they're looking to do something more to curb that discrimination in the workplace. So how have you seen companies respond to bias against BIPOC women in professional spaces? I think that one of the biggest challenges we saw since COVID and everyone's working virtually now is that biases are creeping up that we may not have been aware of and that we really haven't given people managers the tools. So now that companies are starting to focus on DEI. The ones that are doing it right are focusing on standing up their managers to create that more inclusive workplace, including tools to check in with their colleagues. So instead of just jumping on the phone and saying, okay, so did we get all these things done? It's checking and saying, hey, how are you doing, right? Focusing on their work-life balance, over communicating from the top down around creating that inclusive space, right? If it doesn't start from the top and it can't just be talking to talk, right? We need to build those muscle memory, right? And be empathetic and really focus on our awareness around intent versus impact, right? And it's not about explaining that intent. It's about accepting the impact, really. And, and the bottom line is that we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And honestly, that starts with vulnerability. I think one of the challenges that arise is when, um, you know, there are professionals or people who benefit 
from these systems, um, these broken systems and power structures. And you know, one example that I could speak to is obviously I don't speak for the entire API community, but one of the areas that we have discussed um, within our hate as a virus community is the impact of the model minority myth and how um, with that myth, uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander community has often been pitted against other communities of color. And that system is clearly broken, but there are so many different ways that members of our API community have benefited and have been incentivized to uphold those power structures. And so people fall into this cycle of preserving, preserving this broken system. And so I think based off of that as well, um, that leads to some of the folks who, um, rather than trying to dismantle it, uh, continues to preserve that. And so the way we might want to combat it is continuing to educate ourselves and encourage one another to reflect on how we're contributing to this broken system. Well, no, to your point around the, you know, kind of doing this through the, the, the white world, it's, I, I remember something where a CEO of a Fortune 1000 company said to me, he said, at the end of the conversation, he's like, yeah, we really need to figure out this diversity and inclusion thing, because all of my colleagues that are mo mainly white men, they're, they're starting to have to work a lot harder. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> let's rephrase that. They actually have to start working to keep up with the people that are working harder, which are non-white men. Like, it was just fascinating to me that he saw it, that all these white men are complaining. They have to work harder because these BIPOC men and women are, they can't keep up with them. Like, it just, it, it blows my mind that they're kind of like looking at it from that lens. Thank you so much for that. And I'd love to tap into your knowledge, Dr. Al Hassan, as I know you have had extensive experiences leading campaigns, organizing, and interacting with companies. And so how have you seen in terms of the response uh, how they responded when women of color, BIPOC women in workspaces are facing this discrimination and bias. We still have a long way to go. That's basically the summation. There are interesting pushbacks and responses that I've seen. And let's take a little bit of a macro view here. I did wanna address the pandemic's effect on what we see in terms of women of color in the workplace. I've heard it say that the pandemic is not the great equalizer, it's a great revealer. So there's a hyper visibility around some of the issues that we need to contend with if we wanna to move towards a more just and equitable society. And so a great example of this is when the PPP loans went out, uh, the first round of them back in April, about 95% of black small business owners were shut out of that loan. And so were 91% of Latinx folks. So were, or so, so were 90% of native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders and 75% of Asian American businesses. And so what happened back in January when there was another round of PPP loans is they tried to figure out how to work with commerce departments or commerce um, associations from those different racial groups to put them first in line to rectify what had happened. So we have to be able to recognize that kind of failure in the workplace and say, we are gonna take the charge and make up for the ways we've, we've, uh, we've reproduced that in our own environment. So that comes first. And as Robert was saying, we have to think about the unique challenges that BIPOC women face within their household that needs to be attended to when it comes to looking at mobility or offering um, offering a pathway to to a different sort of role or to higher management positions, they might be taking care of their entire household. And especially during the pandemic, they might be the mothers teaching their children as they're trying to manage the the budget sheet, the, the budget balance and do all and, and then their extended family that they were are probably caring for. So being conscious of the unique challenges that BIPOC women are facing and then attending to those challenges and working them into any kind of either promotion or incorporation is a requirement if we're gonna move past this moment. Absolutely. Um, and Robert and Tammy, I see you guys kind of nodding your head. Did you guys wanna get in on this one? Yeah, so after uh, the murder of George Floyd, so many CEOs called me up and said, hey Rob, I need a black person to come up and talk to our company. I'm like, no, you're going to get up. You're going to talk to your company. We'll sit behind you and mentor you and start to 
help you grow and build those muscles, right? But there's no way in hell we're going to put a black person up in front of your entire company to protect you. And it's not up to them to go out and tell, it's not up to your black employees to say, what do we need to do? It's up to you to share. These are the resources we have for our black employees. These are the resources we have for our non-black employees. And this is what we're doing as a company to move forward, to learn about what we need to do to better ourselves. Um, I, I, you know, one thing I also have observed with a lot of the companies that we're working with, I, first of all, first off, I absolutely agree with what both what Dr. Al Hassan and Robert um, have shared in regards to what factors are so important for companies to consider the unique challenges related to BIPOC women in the workplace. Um, I, I think something else I wanted to point out as well is in terms of um, what I've observed with companies is with the pandemic forcing us to migrate to this predominantly digital world and space, um, in some ways it's actually also become more convenient for these companies to engage in performative activism in some sense. Um, for instance, uh, that this applies to people as well. One example is there was a huge wave of influencers, for instance, in New York and LA that, you know, rightfully so, and uh, experienced backlash for using BLM protests as photo opportunities. And we've also seen companies release blog posts and statements about how they stand with BLM and stand against um, uh, hate against Asian Americans due to COVID. Um, with that said, you know, people and companies are both patting themselves on the back on their backs after signing these pledges and posting on social media about how much they care about creating these fa fair workplaces and how they stand for women in the workplace. But there's no real backbone to, as to how they're actually going to deliver on those promises. Um, and they're not putting in any real effort to evaluate how they as a company are contributing to these issues and what actionable steps that they might be able to take to address them. So I'm, I'm really grateful for um, both Robin and Dr. Al Hassan for proposing some of those solutions uh, for companies to consider. And so if we look at what happened in December where 410,000 jobs were lost, and if we take out the gains of those losses, 100% of them were women. And then if we specifically look at BIPOC women within our country, OK, so I think it was Harvard came out with a study as well. You know, you have two thirds of black women are single mothers. Almost 50 percent of Hispanic women are single mothers. Now, we're all working from home now for the most of us. A lot of children are not going to school. Right. And if they are going to school, if they're coming home, there's really not a lot of daycare. You're worried about covid. You're worried about all these different parameters and there's no support from them. So. I, I, you know, I, I'm fearful of what we're going to see from the continued job loss of women in the workforce, specifically BIPOC. Let's take the numbers that Robert offered us and some of the other numbers that, that the rest of the panel brought up and think about how that actually manifests to the pandemic crisis that we're seeing and the numbers we're seeing. I'm in Los Angeles, unceded Tongva land. And of course, what our discussion finally has been the disproportionate number of lives from the Latinx community and the Black community that have been direly affected by this pandemic from the amount of people who are infected to the amount of people who have died. And how does this workplace phenomenon of laying off women of color, especially vulnerable women of color, first manifest BIPOC women? Well, they have to move into multi-generational or multi-family households. So they might also be forced or people in the family might be forced to take up gig economy essential worker jobs that are not fully protected by healthcare or access to, uh, good quality access to healthcare so they will be the last in line for that kind of care and of course we already know from the incredible community of doulas like latham thomas of what happens with black maternal mortality rates not black women not being believed if they're in pain so you can, you can trace this line from the vulnerability of their workplace to their actual death. And that is horrifying. And of course, this is also happening for Latinx women. Now, the other thing that we need to think about, you know, in my profession as a professor, I've seen this so vividly, is that I think it was Slate or Salon came out with an article about professors being the, um, their, their second job being a therapist. So BIPOC women, 
especially during this pandemic where a lot of our students are going through incredible struggles and challenges with family member being diagnosed with COVID to family, uh, to, to partners, to parents losing their jobs. So they don't even know if they could stay in school. We've become the, re the uh, receptacle of those concerns. And then off hours, during office hours, we are the ones who are spending a lot of our time addressing some of those issues because BIPOC women are seen as maternal figures in workplaces. And especially with students of color, and then this goes back to an earlier point we were talking about, which is when you don't have enough of us in workspaces, and let's say you have students of color at the university, and I'm the only woman of color who is in this department, they're gonna come to me with their unique challenges. They're not gonna depend on anybody else because they think I'm, I'm gonna be the one to understand. So that's why when there is a workplace shift, it's not just one policy HR or C-suite has to think about, it's the entire enterprise of the workplace or different departments within the workplace working together to address what it means to bring in BIPOC women. Yes, and the thing is, is that it is something that's problematic even right now. Uh, you know, the Institute for Women's Policy Research recently put out a uh, study research report and it was so incredibly just damning when it shows that women's job losses have been compounded by racial and ethnic differences. As of February, 2021, unemployment is 67% higher for black women and 73% higher for Hispanic women than for white women. That is very problematic because essentially you're losing the opportunity to not only have these voices and the talent contributing to our workforce, but then also individuals need to be able to be economically independent to support themselves. So we don't wanna lose that access and we need to uplift BIPOC women in these workplaces. Uh, and I thank you very much, Dr. Al Hassan, for really segueing us into talking about how the pandemic has created this perfect storm for uh, essentially holding back women who are professionals and happen to be black indigenous or people of color. It's extremely problematic. And so I would love to kind of navigate that discussion more to help people see ways in which it can manifest when it comes to microaggressions, biases, and behavior in the workplace so people can able, be able to identify it in this new digital era. So I open it up to you all. Uh, and Tammy, I guess I will ask you first uh, in part, because, hey, this is what you do for Better Brave. The, um, you know, some forms that we've seen um, this manifest have included a lot of online harassment. And so this could be anything from um, lewd photos that are being sent through social media channels, as well as through Slack channels, Discord channels. Um, you know, another, um, the form of attack that we've also been seeing has been related to more coordinated attacks in this online space as well, where um, women, especially those who have a bigger presence in media as well, or are talking about topics that are controversial, <laughs> um, are faced with coordinated attacks from different communities, whether it's Reddit communities or these small communities on Discord who plan these coordinated um, tweet storms or harassment um, through these online channels. And so I think as, as we continue to make the shift, you know, even post pandemic, we're going to continue to start moving into this digital space and online space where more, more people are going to be working remotely. It'll be even more imperative for us to address these type of challenges that BIPOC women are facing online. Yes, um, definitely seeing this change in terms of uh, the online space and working with coworkers because now everyone's a lot of people are in their homes and there's that less of a level of that added you know professionalism and so we've seen things uh, from you know people operating on Zoom and not necessarily being fully clothed uh, you know those barriers that have been broken down that allow people to feel a little bit more comfortable and unfortunately at times too comfortable and so bias can definitely manifest itself in how we communicate with one another virtually and that feeling that, hey, I'm a little bit more at ease and in a comfort, comfort space. And so I can kind of say what I want. Maybe I comment on your background or I'm sending text messages to you late at night when that generally wouldn't be the case because we don't have these parameters established for professional environments. 
And Robert, I know you are in the C-suite and you also do you know, work with a number of businesses and individuals in the C-suite. And so I was wondering, since we've moved to this remote workspace kind of environment, how have you seen employers handle bias in this virtual world when it's directed toward BIPOC women? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it's, I mean, a lot of companies are scrambling because there is no silver bullet. And let's be honest, it's, you know, it's nothing's really changed for BIPOC women. It just exasperated even more. You know, something that, you know, Dr. Al Hassan said you were saying about, you know, being at home, like this is our homes, this is our safe area. And now people are coming into this area. So I've seen people shame BIPOC women for, you know, your hair looks good look, looking down, it, but it's not really professional, right? Or, or what is that hanging on the wall behind you? Is that, is that something from African history? I mean, just some of the things that come out, it's, it's to your point too, Tammy, you're saying how people are just taking these, just thinking that they can say what they want and they're kind of letting, being too comfortable. And Adrian, you were mentioning this earlier and companies are really scrambling. And again, it really tries to come up with some etiquette, you know, of what does this look like and being aware because, you know, while we are being more open and having conversations when we're on these video calls, right, which is unprecedented, we've never seen this before. And we do have the ability, if we are triggered, to go to a safe space. It's now our colleagues are coming into our homes and it's that work-life balance is starting to disappear. Now, imagine being a BIPOC woman or a woman in general, just having children. You know, my youngest is 17. I don't know how I could deal with this with, uh, without making sure that every single one of my children had a driver's license in a car because it's, it's having them at home and having to rely on parents when they're stuck at home. And it's a very different, you know, for being a professor, you know, having to be that therapist because they don't have their friends to go to. They're not rooming with their roommates like they used to. It's a total different dynamic shift. And here, once again, we say the matriarchy coming to protect and trying to help heal. And so leaders within organizations need to start embracing that, harnessing that energy and being able to move that throughout the organization. Absolutely. Now that we have a solid footing on what the status quo looked like for BIPOC women pre-pandemic and that push for racial justice, and we also have a view of what it looks like now, let's talk about making change, particularly in terms of it making dollars and cents for businesses today, and, and also for them to have incentive to make that change. And Robert, we're gonna go ahead and tee it up back to you. You know, in addition to being the COO of Jennifer Brown Consulting, I also understand that you are the CFO and so you control the money. So what should economically incentivize these companies to want to eliminate bias against BIPOC women in the workplace? To be candid, it's, it's kind of, I don't know why we have to keep having this conversation. And I know the three of you have had this conversation many times. You know, why is diversity, equity, and inclusion important? Uh, we know, you know, one of the things that Adrian mentioned earlier was that the research from the International Center uh, for Research for Women, so that companies lose up to a, almost a quarter million dollars per employee due to gender-based discrimination, right? On top of that, there are hundreds of studies out there showing the impact of focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion, most of them pointing to a minimum increase of revenue starting at 20%. So that should be a incentive enough. And again, we can't pretend that we're not aware of this data. There's a quote by William Wilberforce, who was a British politician that fought to abolish the slave trade in, in Europe. And he said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again, that you did not know. So it's time to stop focusing on what's the incentive to accepting the, the, the data that we know is real and start implementing it. Yeah, we indeed know it's real without question. Uh, you know, and to build on that, as I explained in my book, you know, there is research out there that shows that women who are harassed in workplaces are six and a half times more likely to leave the company. That's avoidable turnover costs, not to mention the cost of lost productivity, which for the average employee, we're looking at about uh, $27,000. And these companies, they really need to stop throwing away this money because there's also considerable costs associated with reputational damage once the companies are exposed for mistreating BIPOC women. So I'd love to direct a question to Dr. Al Hassan. You know, in this past summer of 2020, we saw a racial reckoning with BIPOC women professionals coming forward about the abuses that they experience in workplaces. And, you know, from what went down at Ellen and really what took down the wing, we've seen firsthand what being exposed can do to companies that sanction mistreatment of the most marginalized. And given that you're an organizer and you encourage people to lift up their voices, 
What do you think companies need to know about the cost of continuing to give lip service to diversity as opposed to doing something to support it? Yeah, they can't hide behind black squares and pledges anymore. And so they thought that this was a continuation of PR making, but now that we have this this outlet that is social media, you know, we can we can talk about the ways that social media does open up BIPOC women to harassment, but it also gives them an opportunity where they might not have access to mainstream media or to be on those channels to to voice out what they've experienced in those companies that put those pledges out. I've had friends who will on Instagram stories post in their close friends their experience because they're trying to grapple with what it means to also be that voice against a massive company that has the money and litigation power to silence you. But when we come together, going back to the organizing part, when it's not just one person, when we come together and support that one person who's experienced that harassment, the racism, the sexism in the workplace, and they are trying to be the, the voice on, on Twitter, we, that's how we can push companies to make more substantive material change. I, I, you know, something that also came to mind is, um, you know, not only is it the right thing to do for companies to, um, to create a better workplace for BIPOC women, but, you know, just adding on to the economic value piece, not only are they, um, you know, uh, there are co significant costs they're dealing with um, when they fail to address uh, these issues in the workplace, but there's actually significant value upside for these companies as well to, to support more women in the workplace. One example is a Boston consulting group uh, looked at over 350 companies and found that female founded teams raised less money uh, than their male counterparts, but they generated 78 cents in revenue compared to male led startups that generated 31 cents in revenue. In addition to that, first round capital also found that companies with a female founder uh, performed a whopping 63% better than all male co-founded teams. And so I think that's another really huge incentive for companies to pay attention. And I think going back to Dr. Al Hassan's point as well, um, another factor that we, we should consider and companies should consider is that, you know, people are becoming more aware of these different issues that are going on. And we're more likely to speak up, especially with a wave of Me Too. We want to continue to voice um, how we feel about these issues and stand up for what's wrong. And we're going to hold our companies accountable. And so I think companies need to understand that and be able to take proactive measures to address it. Indeed, companies do need to understand it because there is a huge cost associated with having people speak up, that reputational damage there. There was a 1500 participant survey that was conducted by the Harvard Business Review and that found that customers are far less likely to patronize a business that's exposed for mistreating women and women employees. And so that cost can show up at your bottom line unless you're willing to invest in change. And so let's talk about what companies can do to invest in change. Now, Robert, I know that you are very, very active in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space and those efforts, especially in virtual spaces now that we've moved online. So how can we uh, get companies to be in the place where they see not only the value of it, but what they can do actively to make change so that all of their employees, including BIPOC professionals, feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard? You know, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I think we need to focus on is, is truly around leadership. And I think we've lost our way what that means. And, and Tammy, you were, when you were talking just a moment ago, it kind of hit me that I really never considered that, you know, I work for Jennifer Brown Consulting. It's a woman owned company and how much she's helped create the place for me to grow as a leader, um, where that's something I studied my whole life, but she's done something that's given me more than that. And I think it's because it's the first time I've actually worked for a woman um, a woman at her level. So I think as companies start to work through, it's really focusing on the leadership. Once you create inclusive leadership, right, that's going to allow that to trickle down because we know the biggest challenge within any company is managing mid-level managers, right? Well, it, it, and every single one of you have said, you know, the companies need to walk the walk. You know, after the murder of George Floyd, we saw a lot of companies say, we're going to give you Juneteenth day off. That's a stroke of a pen. That's, that's not an action item. 
right? Why not put something behind that? So I did see some companies do the right thing where they turned around and said, listen, you want to take the day off? We'll pay you to take the day off. Here's a list of resources within the community where you can help try to become more educated around this. Or maybe it's sitting here and let's read a book together by a black author around what's going on, right? We all have to learn together. We have to create that space of being comfortable, being uncomfortable and being vulnerable. And as leaders, we have to demonstrate when we make mistakes. So if I jump on this panel and I say, okay, guys, let's get going. I get a look from Adrian, it's going, wow, sorry, inclusive language. Hey folks, let's get going. We have, as leaders, we have to be able to show up the way we expect everyone else to show up. Most definitely, and showing up is so incredibly important. And the thing is, there are a lot of resources out there for these companies uh, that I have participated in, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion training that's tailored toward helping people understand the biases that they may hold at the unconscious level that is directed toward BIPOC women professionals. And to continue to give that education, as Robert emphasized, and that learning, but more has to be done in that regard. And it's also really important for companies to look at how are you paying people? Create these spreadsheets that show so you can see are the uh, you know, unconscious biases ending up playing out in pay uh, for people of color, women of color, BIPOC professionals. And you can start to see where the inequities lie. The thing is we need companies to put in the effort to make the change and to actually show up uh, as Robert indicated. Uh, so, so last year, there was an article in the New York Times talking about 80% of white men manage corporate America. And it really got me thinking about um, a couple of years ago at the Better Man Conference, I'm a co-founder of, we had Tony Porter up on stage. And he was talking about um, women being um, harassed, assaulted, sexually and otherwise. And he talked about how, you know, here are all the men in, in the world, right? And that it's only this small bit of men that are actually doing doing what they're doing right and the reality is that all the rest of us are allowing that small group to do that so i guess i'm saying if we wanted to have pay equity if we wanted to have bipoc women a seat at the table we we have the ability to do that we just have to actually make it happen and again it's not rocket science the numbers are there so we just need to move forward and actually start to to be comfortable being uncomfortable and and get this done what we have to understand is presence doesn't equal power. So the ways that we have to be molding our policies and initiatives in the workplace to disrupt harassment or discrimination towards BIPOC women is to lead around how does it look like and what does it look like to build their power in these spaces. Thank you, Dr. Alhausen. Do you have any concrete ideas on what companies need to do if they truly want to show up at the table when it comes to uplifting BIPOC women professionals? I think there needs to be a real investment in mentorship. Like put the money behind that. And what I mean is you, if you want to bring in a BIPOC woman who is in the C-suite, you should also figure out another position for a BIPOC woman in the C-suite so that they could do peer mentorship. And then also at every level, right? Mid-management, entry level. But what, what I mean by financially investing in that is not just getting the position filled. You have to give people a grant, a stipend to be able to do the work outside of the workplace that prepares and trains people to be able to be mobile within those companies. And I think very specifically of the informal mentorship that I do within my own company or my workplaces, but how it would be bolstered by investment into that, that paradigm that's being developed. So for example, I very explicitly say that I just take on, especially with academia, black Muslim or black in general women um, and again, across the board, trans, non-binary within that category, Arab, um, Arab women and Muslim women of color as my mentees. I say that for, right, because we don't have each other in that space. So I replicate what I saw with my mentors in academia. And this relationship building is vital for every stage that that person you're mentoring is gonna go through but also for you as a mentor to be able to build a cadre of folks across industries and network that can push and organize as we talked about earlier. So I'd love to see that. And to Robert's point around leadership, what 
what I've seen in the nonprofit space is actually a deep investment, whether it's Rockwood Institute, which they couldn't do this year because of the pandemic, but these leadership retreats that really focus in on developing leaders in these spaces. So you have to put the money behind that in order for it to grow. And I know I, I occupy so many industries, but also as I'm entering the space of Hollywood, this is a big discussion because these diversity slots are usually entry level in the writer's room. So there's, if folks don't know, there's a, a big problem with writer's rooms, representation of BIPOC folks and BIPOC women in general. Color of Change has done an amazing report about black writers and um, TIEE, -E, I'm sorry, I don't know what that translates to, but they work within the Writers Guild. They've revealed, or I believe the Writers Guild revealed that 0.03% of writers rooms have Middle Eastern writers in it. So we don't even know what that breaks down to for women. It's radical. But so these diversity slots where folks get in, they're also seen almost in the same way that affirmative action recipients at the university are seen as the affirmative action case. And so they're treated that way, that they just came in through the back door, and they're usually the only one. That's not enough. So those are the tangible things that I'd love to see. And again, it all starts with a very deep investment in mentorship. It, we, like I said, we and I, I keep saying that we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. This whole thing of, well, it doesn't, and it doesn't affect most white men. And, and honestly, I'll walk out the front door and take my dogs for a walk. If a police officer drives by, I don't, I mean, I look at them like, what are you doing in my neighborhood? But I, just because of everything I've seen, but it mm -hmm. doesn't affect me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you have to really strain your muscles to build muscles, right? right. Like, yeah. When we are, in the gym working out, we acknowledge that it's not gonna be the most pleasant experience, right. but we are gonna be stronger for it. I, mm. but, but also, I mean, you know, to kind of add on to my answer earlier, there is a benefit that having women of color, BIPOC women being the mentors for white men, but also paying for that. Having companies say they're in the space, they know what the culture looks like, the work culture. So here's money because you're already going to be emotional labor and you're also going to be right. a, um, a PhD educator in this space. I think to your point about um, getting paid also for doing the mentorship is so key because I've seen so many situations where BIPOC women especially will get often placed into these like DEI roles, especially at earlier stage startups, for instance, and expected to shape what culture looks like at the company. And they're, they're doing that on top of their existing work and not even getting paid for it, so. As, as Robert was saying, there's a difference from int intent and impact that your, your statement might have a certain intention, but we see you. We see how you, there's a gap between the impact. And so we're gonna continue to fight. Yes, and Tammy, I know that you are the tech guru. And one thing I would love for you to share is, you know, how can these companies create this immediate and lasting progress and change by using technology to counter this backlash that BIPOC women professionals experience? That's a great question. I think there's a few different ways that companies can address these issues using technology. Um, one way is to really invest in different platforms and tools that make reporting safe and accessible for women in the workplace. Um, you know, and that's key word there is safe because there are a lot of reporting tools out there that are used primarily for companies to protect a company's liability rather than actually uh, evaluate um, how employees feel uh, in the workplace. Uh, the second um, potential way is also creating online spaces for BIPOC women to gather share their experiences and exchange resources as well. I think that could also be coupled with mentors um, in the industry who can join those spaces and really um, have a dialogue. And then um, another uh, way companies can get involved is adopting different safe tools and resources for BIPOC women professionals as well. There's tools like Block Party, for instance, that it's a consumer app that meets online harassment for professional or for users. Um, and that could apply to women professionals who are outspoken and are um, you know, out there sharing their work with the community and might still experience unnecessary backlash. 
Um, and with all of that said, though, I do want to point out that technology, as great as it is in terms of a vehicle for driving change, that's not the end all solution. Um, the, the most important thing to address is understanding why we're trying to build solutions around these issues, as well as what, you know, what factors we're focused on. I think going back to Robert's point about leadership, you know, culture starts at the top, really making sure that the leaders are bought into this idea and genu genuinely want to bring about change and create these better workplaces. And to Dr. Al Hassan's point as well, where we want to make sure that we're addressing, um, uh, we're also addressing different uh, unique challenges that BIPOC women are facing in the workplace and designing trainings and solutions um, that really address those issues. Um, and then thinking about how we deliver that through technology. It sounds like companies have a lot of options and hopefully they take advantage of those options. But right now we are out of time. So I wanna thank you all for joining us for this conversation on beating backlash against BIPOC women professionals. And I also wanna thank my fellow panelists Tammy Cho of Better Brave and Hate is a Virus, Dr. Maitha Alhassan of Sawaha, and Robert Bevan of Jennifer Brown Consulting. I'm Adrian Lawrence of the Black News Channel, and thanks again. Take care.